The Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development, RCMRD, was established in Nairobi, Kenya in 1975 under the patronage of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNECA, and the African Union, AU, referred to then as the Organization of African Unity, OAU. The founding members were Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Somalia, and Malawi. Uh, but these have grown to 20 members. Our youngest member is Zimbabwe, which joined in 2014. Uh, as I said, Rwanda joined in uh, 2009. So other members uh, joined uh, progressively from 1975 to that. So it began as a center of excellence, basically to support member states in providing services that were required in mapping and understanding natural resources that these countries needed uh, for their development. So while we have mapping and surveying agencies in countries, the centre backstops them by providing capacity, but also uh, being engaged in the projects in these countries. Having started with only five member states, RCMRD has a current membership base of 20 contracting states in Eastern and Southern Africa. The member states are Botswana, Burundi, Comoros, Eswatini, Ethiopia, Kenya, Lesotho, Malawi, Mauritius, Namibia, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, Seychelles, Somali, South Africa, Sudan and South Sudan, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. RCMRD executes its mandate as part of a global agenda through different thematic areas which include land management and administration, surveying, urban planning, agriculture and food security, weather and climate, land mapping and water-related disasters. 
with a vision to be a premier center of excellence in the provision of geo-information and allied technologies for sustainable development, RCMRD looks to strengthen its member states' and stakeholders' capacity through generation, application, and dissemination of geo-information. Part of its mandate includes components of capacity building in earth observation technologies. This then reiterates the importance of the training wing of RCMRD, referred to as Regional Center Training Institute, RCTI. The Regional Training Institute was started in 2002 when it was offering diplomas, certificate and degrees in conjunction with Jomo Kenyatta University. But as from 2014, the decision was changed and it decided to only focus on TFET training, which has been, uh, which only offers diplomas and certificates and short courses. With that, it started with six students in 2015, and the number of students has grown to 500 and, uh, 500, 540 for last year. These were the courses for diploma and the certificate, and then also offering uh, 100 uh, uh, short courses for 100 students in a year. Uh, the focus of RCTI is to become a TFET uh, center of excellence in technical training where currently is offering four diplomas, that is diploma in Earth Survey, diploma in Cartography and GIS, diploma in, uh, diploma in IT and certificate in Survey and certificate in IT. These courses have been of demand in, in either within Kenya and also within the member states and it has become necessary for RCTI to expand and with the current opening of RCMRD complex and then the current buildings are going to be left for the training institute, we expect the training institute to expand and that has delivered the need of RCTI master plan which is ongoing and the RCTI master plan is focused on bringing up uh, green buildings which will be more for training and then it will also create more space so that more students can be trained so that we can focus on students in the member states and also beyond where we can train people from the whole of Africa and even other places. RCTI will, go, will be able to focus on training the practical technologies and current technologies using practical skills so that the students or the graduates who come from the institute are able to focus and be able to know the current technologies and be able to apply them because it's on hard, uh, it's on hard held practicals. We've actually been doing that for the time that has been there and we want to be able to do more on that. With the current RCMRD complex, RCTI will get all the necessary space that it requires so that uh, it can be able to generate revenue because one purpose of RCTI is to generate revenue to support the member states' contribution and be able to train people from the member states and be able to train even those people who are not skilled or those people who are semi-skilled so that they can be able to get the necessary skills and be able to deliver in the in line. As we develop and we come up with a new master plan, we are going to focus on uh, geo technologies and so that uh, we add on them and then we'll also add more courses so that we can be able to be a whole institute which can be able to meet the objective of its start and be able to deliver what it is required for it. So when the master plan is complete, we are going to come up with even accommodation whereby st students from the member states can be accommodated within the compound and will not have to have a problem of getting accommodation. We'll also be able to come up with more extra courses which are more important and they are coming are happening with, uh, with, the current, uh, with the current development in the member states. Like any other growing institution, RCMRD, having existed for 45 years, has had its fair share of both hills and valleys. Both previous and current managements have had to celebrate some notable milestones and equally so to battle some challenges towards realizing the kind of institution that stands today. So over the years the center has had history of ups and downs. Uh, when it began it was initially the chair of the governing council was actually ECM and members were contributing uh, to its sustenance uh, and they were also donors particularly UNEP, USAID, UNITA uh, but I think in the 90s, I think things changed and uh, the donor support went down. Member states' economies were down, so there was uh, little contribution coming. So the center uh, almost collapsed. It went into serious financial crisis until a decision was made by governing council to downsize it. It 
to very, very minimal staff. I think the staff salaries that time were cut in some cases by 90%. And uh, most of the technical staff were laid off. And each country was asked to pay arrears to their own nationals. So those who are from Kenya were supposed to be paid by Kenyan government. I think a good majority of the staff from Kenya didn't agree with what their government was paying and they went to court. So we had a court case from 2000 uh, that we concluded early this year and settled uh, the, the, the concerned staff. Some of them are already passed away, so we are dealing with their uh, children. So that's something that has also been a big liability arising from that history that we've been able to handle and uh, complete. So from 90, after the downsizing of staff, the, the center tried to look at ways of developing and the Vision 2020 was enacted by the Governing Council in 1997. And it had two main goals. One was to ask the center to be more practical in solving member states' issues so that they can justify their contributions. The second one was the center to be self-sustaining. So all our activities have been to see how can we be more uh, in tune with the needs of the member states and how can we be able to generate revenues to make sure we are not over-reliant on member states. And I wish to state that to date that has been achieved uh, because lots of services are being offered to member states, including servicing their equipment every year. But also, now I can say we, we, our budget uh, currently we only take less than 30% from member states. So we generate close to 80% of what we consume and we've been able to realize, realize surpluses over the years which has been uh, the basis for investment in infrastructure and other things. It is history that defines every organization, the ability to have weathered every past storm to celebrate success. In winning battles, it is important to be as strategic as possible, a mentality plainly depicted by the RCMRD. The institution would not exist if there are no deliberate decisions made to take it past its down moments. So we began now advertising, getting accreditation in different organizations. So I can say in the last three years, student numbers have grown from 50 to almost 600. So almost uh, ten, tenfold. The revenues, it's, it's the biggest contributor of revenue at the moment. So I said, now that we have a school, we can think about uh, accommodation and other things. But we want the school to grow further. For it to grow further, we, they need to expand. So I, in my first year, I was fighting with staff, trying to create extra classrooms. We had a gym somewhere, I closed it to turn into a classroom. So many things. So I realized we need to do something. That's when we came with an idea, we need to build a new office block for us to go to and leave this area for the school to expand. And the task was the school should be able to generate the revenue to actually compensate what we spend on the office block. So where we are now, the office block is complete. The school is at 600, we aim to have at least 1,000 students in the next two or three years. And then they can occupy this whole space. And then we can find the rest of the infrastructure. There are quite a number of things uh, I feel proud we've been able to achieve both on the infrastructure side, but also on the policy side. So uh, the other thing I think we used to complain about in governing council was the lack of systems. So we've developed policies in almost every field for the center to make sure everybody knows how we do things. We got ISO certification. So our quality management systems are now understood and uh, at international standard. Under the leadership of the current Director General, Dr. Immanuel Kurunziza, the center has focused more on policy development and infrastructure advancement as guided by a clearly spelled out strategic plan. We are lucky to have this piece of land. It's about uh, 15 acres uh, that we own as an institution, but it was hardly utilized. Maybe one thing I should mention, when I first came in 2017, we had a challenge. At the extreme end, there used to be trucks parked on the road. So people were trying to encroach on the land. So the first thing we did was to put an enclosure, at least to safeguard the land. But I also felt it is not fair for us to hoard this amount of land 
in the city without utilizing it. We either use it or give it to the government to give it to other people to use. So we engaged a consultant at the University of Nairobi to come and help us develop a master plan. So they studied the area and we told them we want to accommodate ourselves, but we also want a master plan that gives avenues for revenue generation to stay in the center. So they came up with a business park, which is the plan that we have. So within the business park, there is the current office block which we have built that was supposed to be phase one. But in there, there are supposed to be also rental office blocks that will be built in the future to generate revenue for the center. There's even a proposal for a hotel and conference facilities that will all come in to contribute to the revenues. So we, they developed this, did a feasibility to see what is uh, marketable here, uh, the returns uh, on investment. So once we had the report, we presented it to the Governing Council in November 2017. The Governing Council appreciated it and approved it. So in it, we told them this is what we want to do in years to come, but also allow us to begin with phase one. And phase one was to build the office block uh, with uh, attendant in infrastructure so that we can be able to allow the training institute to expand. So that was approved. So we immediately proceeded to engage contractors and the supervisors. And thankfully, as you will see, we've finished phase one. And we finished it without any, any borrowed money or anything, because I think even the hostel, we couldn't fund, but we have been able to build uh, this block, which is uh, almost $5 million uh, from our own savings. Uh, so that is a great achievement as far as we are concerned because we are going to take and that's what i promised the governing council that we will build it we will not ask you for any extra coin and we will not borrow any money to indebt the center and we've been able to achieve that we have the building the center is still financially stable we can be able to engage in other activities and we have given a room to the institute to expand so that's the the, the master plan you'll be able to see that caters for all these facilities as part of the strategic plan, RCMRD kickstarted on a mega project, the building of a multi-faced state-of-the-art complex that will house several facilities for both the institution and some spaces for commercial lease as documented and guided by the RCMRD master plan. So after doing the principles that uh, guided the design, we need to look at the various concepts in order to structurally define uh, the land uh, or the, the development. So, and of course, there were some uh, various uh, causes that influenced uh, the various structural uh, or conceptual models that we wanted to look at. Uh, some of them included uh, uh, the nodes. We needed to define what were the specific areas of interest that we needed to address within uh, the master plan. So, where would be the residential area? What would be the commercial area? What would be the open area, the green spaces? So, we needed to look at this very specific nodes. We also needed to look at uh, the landscaping models. How would we maintain the existing landscape and not disrupt the flow of the land? There was also the circulation. We needed to address how we want to maintain uh, the vehicular circulation as well as uh, the pedestrian circulation without uh, creating some a sort of gridlock between the two. Also that we needed to look at how we can uh, create a, a sort of interlocking or uh, a relation between the existing uh, facilities as well as the new facilities. So in terms of the model that we have here, this is the existing complex that we are in and this is what we intend uh, in future to hold the college or the training institution and also we are also working on a new master plan so that we can be able to emulate the principles that we accomplished this side to also bring them to the school and attract more international uh, students uh, to the business case master plan that we are currently working on the first phase that we've done is uh, the this block which is the rcmrd complex and the other phases will involve the, the three blocks, the four blocks over here, which these are all hotels plus a furnished apartment and a conference area. And then this will be the final block that we intend to do. And now this will be letable offices that will be able to create a secondary source of uh, income uh, for the center. In terms of infrastructure, we've done uh, the entire infrastructure for all the buildings on, on site, apart from the road at the back, which will be done under the second phase. So under sustainability, while we were coming up uh, with the master plan and in the design phase, we thought out to look at what would be the guiding principles that will be able to guide us while we design and we construct this master plan. So what we saw that was very important was the, necessary, was the necessity 
uh, to maintain the center's goals and aims. And this, uh, very importantly, was the sustainable goals and development. So we decided to say that, okay, our development as well as our construction will be a sustainable building. And how do we, uh, how do, we do this and how do we achieve this? So we have various items that we saw as uh, key under sustainability development. We have the sustainability, mobility and transport, as well as efficient green features and passive solar design. When we were developing this uh, concept, we started by analyzing what is already on site. And across the site, we have the existing uh, structures which are more, more or less conventional in terms of design. So in this particular section of the site, we decided to have a complete departure from the norm in terms of design. And we came up with a very amorphous uh, uh, master planning concept. And what you can see here is just one of the many buildings that are supposed to be on this particular part of the site. And as you can see, the shape of the building is curved, more or less welcoming people into this great center. When we were developing the building, we had seven key principles that we wanted to attain. Uh, one, this uh, building is a green building uh, in that it's responding well to the climate. And in order to achieve that, we designed the building to have the following features. One, it has two ways of ventilation. One, we have the cross ventilation, which is across uh, the building, and also we have the stack ventilation. Uh, stack ventilation is purely propagated by the volume of space that you can see at the entrance. So at any given time, we expect the building to run without any need uh, for mechanical ventilation, like ACs and the like, except one or two spaces which are specialized, like the server rooms. Also, when we are designing this building, we wanted it to be fully run from by nat uh, natural lighting. Uh, as you can see, the building has very extensive windows. Uh, it's only a section of the corridor uh, that has no direct access to natural lighting. But the partitions that we have used ensure that natural light gets into the deeper parts of the building. The other thing that also we considered while uh, designing this uh, building was the sun shading devices. Uh, you realize uh, that this building is exactly facing the east and the west. Uh, so that in the morning you expect a lot of uh, heat from the other side and uh, in the afternoon from the other side. So if you look at the building, we have extensions. They may seem as balconies, but ideally that was not the essence behind uh, those spaces. They are supposed to shed uh, the floors below. And also we have these fins. Uh, the sun shading uh, devices over there, they also ensure that we are, the windows are not exposed to direct sun. So we expect the, that the building will not overheat at any given time. If you look at the roof level, uh, we have also created an open space or a terrace. And uh, the idea behind that space over there is to cater as an outdoor within an indoor in that when people are more or less, uh, I can say, stressed with the seating spaces, they can just go there, relax, without coming down here. And it gives them some sense of uh, privacy. Also, that particular roof has a green roof. In essence, what we are trying to do was to compensate for the ground that we have more or less used to bring up the building and take it up to another level. On this other side of the building, we have uh, solar panels. Uh, the idea behind those solar panels was to run this building without the need of uh, power from uh, uh, electricity. Uh, in that the building, is, it can be able to sustain itself without incurring any power bills. Um, over and above that, this is one of the few buildings that have the child minding room. A child minding room is where mothers can come with their nursing babies and take care of them while working. Uh, so in essence, it, it, it ensures that uh, irrespective of what somebody is going through, either it's a man or a woman with a small child, they can still comfortably come and work uh, within this building. Um, the other things that we have also uh, incorporated in this building is uh, the 
the aspect of rainwater harvesting. Next to the building, at around that point, we have an underground water tank. And uh, part of that water tank is used to harvest rainwater. That rainwater is pumped back to take care of these beautiful lawns that you are seeing here. So at the end of the day, the building will have minimal cost as far as maintenance of its facilities are concerned. Also, we are very fortunate that uh, uh, the design also responded well to the COVID uh, design guidelines because the building has very wide corridors, so there's minimum interaction as people move within the floors. Uh, we deliberately also provided for two lifts, and in one case scenario, one lift can be used purely for going up and the other one coming down, so that there's minimal interaction with people in the building. And as you can see, the main door into the building is automatic, so you don't need to touch anywhere. So in that way, it makes people uh, uh, very safe. In terms of universal access, uh, anyone who is disabled can be able to move up and up, up and down the building at any given time. Uh, we have ramps into the building, we have lifts, and each floor has toilets dedicated uh, to the physically challenged uh, persons. The design of the RCMRD complex was a unique one, taking into consideration elements that will bring out an ultra-modern state-of-the-art facility. Its uniqueness is in how each part of the master plan is distinct in itself, yet culminating into a beautiful piece of art and creativity in both the design, efficiency, convenience and sustainability, all rolled up into one masterpiece. So my name is Kenneth Casella. I work with the regional center as the user engagement lead, basically meant to bring the gap between the users and the technology. Uh, service delivery is the act of uh, delivering services to benefit institutions, organizations, as well as uh, individuals that uh, work with various uh, governments, private sector, and also uh, various institutions within Africa and beyond. Uh, one of the key prerequisites to uh, effective and uh, predictable service delivery is infrastructure. Uh, this is both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. Uh, in terms of hard infrastructure, there is a need for an office. Uh, that is basically the nerve center of an institution where most of the aspects and most of the delivery takes place. And we need to ensure that this is well done and this is a create an environment for employees to be able to be creative, for employees to be able to do other aspects in terms of relaxation and also to be able to create an environment whereby there is sharing and there is learning from employees as well. So an office is one of the key areas and this comes along with various uh, uh, infrastructure and various facilities that are meant to promote this as well. So within the same building we've managed to bring all the possible sectors that we, could think, we can think of uh, in one place. That includes a place for uh, lactating mothers, that includes a place for resting, a place for recreation, a place for thinking and a place for creativity as well. And office places to offer uh, joint initiatives in terms of even leasing them out to various people. This complex brings out a, a sense of um, belongingness as the employees right from the office layout that brings out the cohesiveness uh, among the employees. We also have a recreational center up there where we as the employees can take our time to relax from the busy schedule. So it allows uh, flexibility in your work in terms of you can relax uh, and you're able to be more productive in your work. So with the development of the uh, infrastructure at the Maldi complex, it has really increased the visibility as uh, the people are who are using the Nairobi Thika superhighway can easily see us. So the visibility has been increased and we believe that uh, with the visibility it's going to market us more as you're going to have more clients inquiring what we do here at Arce Maldi. As the adage goes, a house is just a house. A home is in how you make it feel. The RCMRD complex boasts of more than just astute structural works. The interiors from the paintings to wall hangings and floor finishings are a perfect match complementing the outside with perfect blended colors and thematic artworks that softly speak out the vision of the center. It does not end there. 
the artistic story of the complex is told through a magnificent representation of the African continent. Uh, so during the design phase of the building, and even while you're constructing the actual building, we are not really thought of how you're going to use uh, the, these walls at the void. So of course, once the building was uh, finalized, we were left with blank walls. So we were forced to think how you're going to use these walls to maybe inspire and uh, to motivate the younger generations as well as the youth. So after much deliberation, uh, we saw an opportunity to use these walls through art uh, to give meaning and as well as to provoke minds. So after all this was done, uh, we had different options, but this is what we finalized on. I see the tree of life, and some may call it the tree that keeps on giving. During hard days and even during tough times, it may suck up all the water from the soil around it. But with proper love and care and proper uh, giving, it gives a lot. Uh, it provides a fruit during the days that are, they are hunger. It provides a shade during the days that uh, the elements are tough. And it also provides a fire for the night to guide us uh, through the darkness. Uh, so the tree of life uh, represents uh, the land of Africa. And with it, the ecosystem that thrives upon it, as well as uh, the people that live on it, with the vast cultures and languages, each unique in its own different way. So these items, properly preserved and protected, uh, ensure us uh, a better and healthier future. So the tree of life as well, uh, it extends uh, through various landscapes. All of this uh, still showing the lands of Africa, the people, the ecosystems. Uh, it extends through the mountains, uh, through the valleys, through the plains, as well as through to the waters. So this represents all the activities that are done on the African soil. It also extends through different times. We have uh, the early mornings, it goes through the day up to the evenings, then all the way to the starry African night. The RCMRD complex is just one point of a long but beautiful journey that the center has embarked on. A journey that every stakeholder, including member states, are a part of. As the institution moves into a new strategic period, commendations and appreciation goes out to all those who have labored to get the center this far. The starting point is really to thank our member states for the faith and confidence they have continued to have in the center. Despite its ups and downs, when the, when the governing council meets, the technical committee meets, you see true ownership of the center. So they all care uh, about the, the, the life of the center. So I want to really thank them and encourage them to keep that and promise them that as a center, we also keep working hard to live to the expectations. So from uh, for the years I have been here, uh, we had the first chair was from Rwanda. Uh, I wish to thank him uh, very much because he was part of the approval process of the current plans that we were implementing. Uh, he was supported by the chair of the technical committee from Namibia. And then currently we have chair from um, Botswana, uh, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth Komotaka, who has been very helpful in really pushing everything we are doing. The other subcommittees as well, I mentioned the, the, the tender committee, especially for this infrastructure development. Mrs. Dokaras or Karanyi from Uganda, who chairs the committee, they are actively involved, making sure we do what we are supposed to do, and I want to thank them. So I wish also to thank, of course, uh, my colleagues and members of staff. I mean, when we began uh, this, this program, you needed to get uh, colleagues to believe in, in, in the vision. Of course, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty uh, from the beginning, but slowly they came up. But there are those who picked up immediately. Unfortunately, some of them are now retired, like Muya, who is to head our, head our geomatic section, was chairing our committee. Uh, another gentleman who has gone to study, uh, Mr. Mina. So these staff were critical in following it up. If you look at the, even the furnishing, there's a design team. I picked a few members from our own staff to make sure what we do here, whether it's the color of the carpet, whether it's the color of the paint, is the tiles, they decided. So it's a team uh, comprising of uh, Stella Masese, Elizabeth Ojuma, and Mordecai Barasa. They were doing the, uh, the design, supported of course by Clark of Works, uh, Kevin, uh, that uh, is part of this uh, interview. So, 
for, for I, I want to thank all those groups and then our partners, our partners who uh, offered unwavering support throughout, throughout this journey. So I want to say, much as we are working on a new vision that will take us beyond 2020 to 2050, uh, we are still holding dear the key objectives of 2020, which is to offer competitive value proposition to member states and then build our own sustainability. And we are on course to do that. Hopefully, we have laid the foundation. Whether it's in policies, whether it's in plans, everything is in place. All it needs is consistency, support, and implementation. So we would wish to really encourage uh, non-contracting member states. I specifically mentioned Djibouti, Angola, Mozambique, Madagascar, DRC, Eritrea, to join the family. There's a lot to benefit from this center, and I think we are trying to show that the center is going places, so it's good that they come and join us and we grow together and serve our continent in this field that is also growing internationally. Yeah.